Well, good morning, church. It is good to be with you today. As many of you know, last week I had this nasty stomach bug and rendered me unable to be here. Uh, but I'm thankful for the health to preach today. I feel great. Uh, I'm excited for this, this message. I, I think Pastor Dennis did a great job last week um, encouraging all of us to be preachers, not in the sense of what I'm doing now, but in the sense of proclaimers of the gospel uh, to those around us. And I hope you uh, listened to that message. I hope you took uh, his next step to write your 60-second testimony. If you didn't get a chance to do that, I'll encourage you to do that uh, at the end of this message. And that's because I believe there's a tie-in between uh, that next step and today's message. I also think there's a tie-in between the message two weeks ago and today's message. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that. But what we need to do now is kind of like strap in and journey back thousands of years because we've been all over, right, with, with, our, with our studies in the Bible. But uh, we got to go back to the book of Exodus, the second book in the Bible. We're specifically going back to the 15th chapter of the book of Exodus. Um, we covered the first 14 chapters in 2022. And now we're going to cover chapters 15 to 20. It's going to take us up to Easter. We'll take a break for Easter and then a few more weeks, uh, maybe two or three more weeks looking at the Ten Commandments. That's the plan. Um, but uh, we are looking at the Israelites' journey into the wilderness. The last time we looked at Exodus, we were looking at their journey uh, from Moses' birth up until uh, crossing the Red Sea. That's where we stopped. We pick up now with them having just crossed the Red Sea. Just to recap, we learned about how Moses, uh, after being born, was uh, really a, it was really special that he survived because he was a Hebrew baby boy and there was a declared massacre of all the Hebrew baby boys. They were supposed to be drowned in the Nile, but his mother put him in a basket and he actually got picked up uh, by someone in Pharaoh's house. And the really cool thing that happened is they actually went and got his mother, his, his birth mother, to raise him in Pharaoh's house. We saw him uh, grow up and kill an Egyptian slave master, and then we saw him flee. And when he fleed, uh, he, he went to a different land, but then in that land, he was there for like 40 years, God appeared to him in a burning bush and told him to go back to Egypt. He goes back to Egypt, and the reason he does that is because he's supposed to go to the, the king, the, the ruler, and tell him that God says, let his people go. And if you don't, right, there's these plagues, and it happens time after time after time. We get to the 10th plague. Pharaoh finally says, fine, you can go. Uh, and they get a little bit of ways away, and then Pharaoh's like, actually, I changed my mind again. He sends his armies after the, the, the slaves, the, the Israelite slaves, and he seems like he's going to get them back because they're trapped between the army and the Red Sea. There's nowhere for them to go until the miraculous happens again. And what we find is that this cloud comes and is formed, and the Egyptians aren't able to see the Israelites. It confuses them, and the Red Sea parts like two walls on the side of them, and they cross by on dry land. And then this cloud clears after they make it across, and the Egyptians see this miraculous thing has happened and think maybe they can cross too. But once they get out in the water, it crashes down, they all die. That is where we pick up at the end of chapter 14, and we'll be in chapter 15. But let me read the last two verses of chapter 14. It says this, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord had used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. They escaped the slavery that their people had been in for over 400 years. If you, if you really think about that, that means their, their great, 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 I don't know how many of those I need to do, but grandparents were free. But none of them had ever tasted freedom. Every single person there was born into slavery and had lived their entire life in slavery, and then they are now free. And so the good question to ask is, what are they going to do? What are they going to do as their first act of freedom? It's very interesting. Look at Exodus chapter 15, the beginning of verse 1. It says this. Then, the word then is important. It means after that, then Moses and the people of Israel sang 
this song to the Lord. What do they do? They sing. You know, this is the first song in the Bible. It's interesting. I didn't realize that as I uh, began to study this, but uh, I just assumed there was, had to be one before it because we get through the whole, there's no songs in Genesis, right? And, and th- this is the first song in the Bible. The Bible is full of songs. We have a whole book called Psalms, maybe one of the more familiar books in the Bible. It's, it's just song after song after song, but this is the first one. And so the questions that I want to answer today are this. Why did the Israelites sing? And, and then second, uh, what does this have to do with us? Because we're not Israelites, so what does that have to do with us? Uh, but here, here's our main point for today. Singing together is a vital part of being one of God's people. Singing together is a vital part of being one of God's people. Have you ever thought about how strange it is that we sing as a part of our gathering every single week? Like, I've been in, I grew up in church. Uh, I, I believe I was converted later uh, in, in my early, uh, like around 20 is when, I, when I, my conversion actually happened. But I grew up in church, and then I've been in church since I was 20. I don't think I've ever been to a Sunday gathering where we didn't sing. I can't think of one. I don't know that there is, like, I don't, I just don't think there was one in the churches that I attended, and, and I don't think you would find uh, very many churches where in the last 30 years they had a gathering on a Sunday morning to uh, worship God, and there was not singing. But if you think about that, uh, it's strange, because we don't sing when we gather at other places, right? Like, if you go to a concert, it's like, there are people on stage that sing, and some of the people sing along. When we go to a, a sporting event, they will sing the national anthem, and some people will sing along. But the majority of people, when you come to church on a Sunday morning, are singing. It's, it's like, it's a very unique thing in our world, and I think you have to ask the you would ask the question if you were new to the church experience is, why are all these people singing? I don't understand. It's it's strange, but it's also vital. And here's what I mean by vital. You know, if you go to the hospital because you just need to get looked at, something's going wrong, like they're going to do some tests, right? They're going to check your vital signs. They're going to check things like your pulse. They're going to check... Uh, they're going to check and see, like, if you're breathing, right? Maybe you went to the hospital on a stretcher, right? What they're trying to figure out is, is this person alive? And then if so, how alive are they? Are they just barely hanging on, or are they, are they nice and, and strong? But I believe when it comes to the singing of God's people, it's a vital sign. It's not the only vital sign, but it is a vital sign sign. Like, the question is, are you spiritually alive? Or are you spiritually dead? We saw this two weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 5, when it said uh, to be filled with the Spirit. That was the command. And then there was all these participles that explain what it looked like. And the one we were focusing on was giving thanks always and for everything. We struggled through what that means and all that. But before that, the first sign of being filled with the Spirit is in Ephesians 5, 19, where it says this, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. When God makes you alive in Christ, he makes you a singer, places his Spirit in you, and the result of that is you sing. Not just by yourself, in the shower, right? But with other believers. And to be clear, I'm not saying, nor do I want to imply that your life should turn into a musical. I hate musicals. I mean, I don't like musicals. My mom would appreciate that. I don't like musicals. Either sing or speak. I don't like when people Speak by singing. It's annoying. Anyways, but did you know singing is one of those things you just can't get away from? Like you might, listen, listen, this is a strong statement. You might sin your entire Christian life by coming to church and never sing. I believe that's sin. You might sin your entire life by doing that. You won't do that in heaven. 
You know they actually sing this song in heaven? It says it in the Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. Let me show you. It says, and they, that's the angels of God, sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord the Almighty, or Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. They sing the song of Moses. Check that out. This is not a 90s hit that people are tired of. This is a song that's thousands of years old and is sung for thousands and thousands of years. It's special. But we need to look at it. We'll read verse 1 to 3. I will not sing it. I did try in my office to sing it, and I, I can. It doesn't sound very good, but uh, we're going to just read it. So I'll start with verse 1. We'll read down to verse 3. It says, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. And it says sang, but really they, sang, they were singing. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. A couple of things we need to consider before we continue. First is this statement that could make you a little bit uncomfortable. The Lord is a man of war. That's the same thing as saying the Lord is a warrior, right? We're more comfortable and and familiar with that language. But I I do think this language is, this is the correct language, man of war. But we're like, God is a man of war? I thought he was like just loving and so, you know, touchy-feely and all this makes me feel good, all that. No, listen, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is a, a warrior. He is loving. But because he is loving, he will also fight for his people. Just read your Bible. He is not a pushover. Second thing is that this song was sung in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, the way that they wrote things like poetry and songs is a little different than the way we do today. So one of the, one of the big schemes of, of song lyrics today is this last syllable rhyming of each line. So it's like Jack and Jill went up the hill, right? Guess what happens when you translate that? I don't know what hill is in other languages, but it probably doesn't rhyme with Jill, right? And so now it no longer works. Like the whole thing that you based, the, you chose the word, you chose the name Jill because you were trying to make it rhyme, right? You could have picked John and Jill or John and Jack or whatever, but it doesn't work because it doesn't rhyme. In Hebrew, their scheme was based on something called parallelism. Parallelism is this idea that there are two lines and the two lines, the understanding of the two lines uh, must be considered together. So there'll be one line and the second one. And so we'll, we'll look at an example, but the first line will either give more details to the second line, it'll say the second line, and the second line will say the first line in a different way, or it'll say the opposite to bring it out. That's the way that they uh, wrote poetry and wrote songs. That's how the Psalms are, are written, Hebrew parallelism. It's a, it's a really cool study if you, if you look into it, but no, the cool thing about it is that translates into every language. No matter what language the Bible is translated into, we have these songs that have their major uh, element of why they are constructed the way they're constructed as something that can be transferred to all people in all places because it's not about rhyming, it's about the meaning of the lines. So you can say it however you want, but it's going to still give us the picture. Take verse 4, for example, to show you this. It says, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. First line tells us that Pharaoh's chariots are cast into the sea. The second line adds to it, it says, his chosen officers, too. What sea was it? The second line tells us, the Red Sea. That's the way it's meant to be understood. You look at two lines together. You never look at a single line when you're trying to understand what the author was intending but we're going to read a few more lines because I want you to notice the type of language that's used in, in the song. Uh, so look at verse 5. We'll read down to verse 8. It says, The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. 
At the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up. The flood stood up in a heap. The deep congealed in the heart of the sea. Look at the language. There's all this, uh, these, these images like the enemy is shattered. Enemies don't shatter, right? Glass shatters, but it's using language to convey meaning because it's a song. But then I want you to, to notice that it says in verse 8, as it talks about God's power, it talks about God's nostrils. God doesn't have nostrils. At least he didn't then, right? Jesus, in the, after the incarnation, has nostrils, right? Jesus is in heaven as a man. He has nostrils. Now, Jesus, this is pre-incarnation. There is no person in the Trinity, Father, Son, or Spirit, with nostrils when this song is written. So what is it? It's called anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism, right? It's this, it's this attributing uh, attributes of man to something else. And what we have here is God being pictured as so powerful that you know how when we like blow air out of our nose, I won't do it because something might come out, but like we do that, the only thing that's going to move when I do that is like a tissue. But it's saying when God did that, it parts the sea. Now compare the two. It's, there is no comparison. When I exhale, I can move a tissue. When God exhales, God can part an entire sea and make it stay up consistently. It's saying how powerful God is. This is the type of language that's used in the Psalms because we don't have words to describe how powerful God is, so we get this picture to compare. This is what it's like for God to do what you do. It's like nothing for him. This is the type of language that we get in these Hebrew Songs. But let's keep moving. Look at verse 9. It says, The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. So at this point, I think it's appropriate for us to consider why this song was sung. It's our first point for today. It's this. The Israelites sang in response to what God did for them. Israelites sang in response to what God did for them. Remember, this is the first time in the Bible. When did it happen? After God delivered them. This is why they sang. They were about to be captured and brought back to Egypt as slaves, and God made a way when there seemed to be no way. They sang. There is no verse in the Bible that says, and God said, sing me a song. They just did it. I also want you to notice that Moses has not been mentioned anywhere in this song, and he will not be mentioned anywhere in this song. There's only a few more verses to, to consider in the song, but Moses' name is not mentioned a single time. Moses wrote the song, but his name is not in it. That's because Moses is not worthy of the worship because God could have used Miriam or Aaron or some other name of person that, we, that was existing that we don't know their name. He could have used some no-name person, Right? This is why we don't praise people like Mary. God chose Mary to be the one to give birth to Jesus, but we don't praise Mary. Mary is not worthy of praise. God is. When we write worship songs, they are not supposed to be about people, but about God. We praise God in worship songs for who he is and what he's done. Verse 11 asks the rhetorical question, who is like you among the gods? Who is like you among the gods? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no one. The, the reality is, the truth is, there is no other gods. What we have are other entities that people worship, that people serve, but they're not gods. Right? What they are, biblically, is they are demons, or they're made up, one or the other. But they are nothing in comparison to our great God. They do not part seas and deliver people from slavery after 400 years. They do not uh, save anyone. 
So make no mistake about it. What we sing matters. If someone were to edit this song and say, and praise Moses for his great strength, this song would be a song that we should not sing. You can't write that into this song. Worship songs teach theology just as much as sermons do. And if you think about it, um, you probably have more worship songs in your head than you do sermons, right? Than you do scriptures. Think about how many words are in a worship song. If you know a worship song, that's like knowing a chapter of the Bible. But if I took a survey of this room, there might be less than people on my hand, less than five people, right, who could quote an entire chapter of the Bible. But I bet you that more than half of you could quote ten full songs if we just played the tune. Ten full worship songs. All the words without error. Half of you could do that. Worship songs are important. They are impactful And so because of that, at Bethany, the elders take responsibility for what we sing. If something is unbiblical in a song, doesn't matter how it makes us feel, doesn't matter how how catchy or how popular it is, we're just not going to sing it. If you think about the last song, not the last song, it was the first song. I don't know what number it was. We sang three songs. I'll talk about all of them. We sang the rock one move. That was the last song. That's based on Scripture. Right? It's based on Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus teaches that if you build your house on the rock when the storm comes, it will not fall over. Right? We sing about that. We sing uh, the throne room song where it says, Jesus is in this room here right now, here right now. That sounds really great, but is it true? Right? To be honest, the first time we, when I heard that song, I was like, let me look that up because it sounds too good. Let me check. And I found it. Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. It's biblical. Or take scandal of grace. The scandal of grace, you died in my place, so my soul will live. I'll show you this one. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 and 10. It's taught many places, but here's one. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that's the scandal, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. The song says, so my soul will live. We can't find a concept sung in a worship song in Scripture. We ought not sing it. So we check him, do our best. If you find something and you have a question, send me an email. If we can't find it, we'll stop singing it. It's a promise. We might like the song, but it's got to be biblical. Let's look at the rest of Moses' song. It shifts from uh, the past tense, talking about what God has done, to uh, what God will do. Different translations handle it differently because they get nervous. They get nervous about whether or not Moses could have sang about future things at this point. I don't understand why we get nervous about God telling Moses stuff that was going to happen in the future. God just parted a Red Sea, so why are we nervous? I don't understand. So different translations will use different tenses, but it's written in the future tense regardless of what your translation says. The next verses are all future, talking about what's going to happen in the future. Some people say, they try to, they try to uh, reconcile, some scholars, they're like, well, uh, since the Pentateuch, which includes Exodus, wasn't written until later, it's probably the final version of the song. That song. I'm like, what do, why do we even need, who cares? Why does it matter? Either they sang it later and it did happen, because we know this stuff happened, or God gave it to Moses when it was prophesied. Just say that and move on. We don't need to, like, try to make an excuse for it. God could give prophecies to Moses to sing about. And God could have added, gave them more of the lyrics to talk about later. It makes no difference. But anyways, uh, when you see it, uh, you'll see it. I think the ESV only gives us a little bit of future tense uh, because of this. Look at verse 13. It says, you have led your stead, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Eden dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. Till they are as still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. 
till the people pass by by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Some of those lyrics are tough. This is like not a touchy-feely song at all. And yet, it's a song that's sung in heaven. Think about that. It's very interesting. But regardless of the answer to whether uh, this is something, this is the final version of the song, and they put it here because when they wrote it, they were like, let's just keep it together. Regardless of that, what we see is the response that the enemies of God have to the work of God, and it says it causes them to tremble. And what's prophesied in verse 17 does come to pass. God's people do what verse 17 says says. They come to the mountain that God says they will. We'll see this as we continue our walk. They're going to come to Mount Sinai where the law, the Ten Commandments, are are given. This does come to pass. But before we look at the last few verses for today, I just want to consider another quick point about singing, and it's this. Singing together as God's people is not for entertainment. It is for God. It's very important that you understand this. It's very important because there is no way that you would know this unless you were taught this. Because when you go to a concert, it's for entertainment. When you go to places where people are singing and you sing with them, it's because you're there to be entertained. Church is different. Yes, we want concert quality music up here. I want that. But that's not what it's about. So I don't feel the privilege to come in here and stand there like this while they sing. I'm like, that sounds good. Yeah. You know, some people have told me that uh, they don't mind being late to church because all they miss is the songs. They're just like, as long as I'm here in time for the sermon, right? Wrong. The reality is you might not feel that the singing is important. But God disagrees with you. This is something that God cares about. We do not sing to have a good time. We do not sing because we're having a good day. We sing because God is worthy of our praises. And we do it together. Yeah, sure, you could, you could sing throughout the week. So, like, if you're running late and you don't have time to sing on a, on a Tuesday morning, sure, sing another time. But guess what? We only gather to sing as a church for 20 minutes a week, so you should be here. You should be here for all 20 minutes. Go to the bathroom beforehand, right? Get your coffee beforehand or afterhand, right? This is important. It's a time where we ascribe praise to God for who he is and what he's done. And you're like, that's, that's, that's hard. It takes planning, it takes effort. Listen, you want to talk about effort? Think about this text. Two to two and a half million people is how many people crossed the Red Sea, according to the, like, that's like an agreed upon number from scholars. All these people crossed the Red Sea. And it says in verse one that Moses and the people sang. How did they do that? This is a long time ago. No microphones. Right? How do they do it? For real? No, no, no printers that they could print lyrics and hand them out to everybody. Even if they did that, that would be a lot of work. No projectors to put two lines one at a time so we don't get distracted. Right? Don't have any of that. Like, how did they do it? Call and response. Do you know how many people two and a half million people is? You know how many people fit in the Super Bowl stadium last Sunday? It was a small stadium. It only fits 70,000 at max capacity. I was surprised. I thought it was going to be like 100 because 70,000 is low, like even for like a big college. 70,000 people. It's 35 stadiums full of people. 35 Super Bowl stadiums full of people is how many people we're talking about singing. All together. How do you do that? Call and response? What if you line them up football, football fields wide and just deep? It's going to go for a long way. How long would it take to do call and response without a microphone? We're going to call. Okay, you, you're the dividing line. We're going to call to you, and then you call to you, and then you call to you, and then you call to you, and you call to you. Like, we're going to be like 30 football fields deep of people. It's going to take like five hours to sing this song. 
I'm serious. Or like, like I, listen, I would like to be challenged with this in real life. Like, give me two and a half million Christians. We're all going to sing the same thing with no technology. All right, here's the plan. I want all of the grandfathers, great-grandfathers that are alive. I want them all. We're going to have a meeting. We're going to rent out a stadium. I need 100,000 of you all in here. And I'm going to teach you the song. You can't use any technology. We're going to be here all day until we have it memorized. And then you're going to go and teach your family. Okay? And then we're all going to gather back together. You have a month to get this figured out. And then we're going to get back together. Right? Everybody needs to be at this place. Go to the bathroom first. We're only going to sing this song once. Everybody get here. And then we're going to praise God together. It's your job to make sure your family knows all the lyrics. And I don't feel like singing. It doesn't matter. God delivered us. Sing. Seriously. This is a problem solver in me. Like, there's got to be some way they did this. And I don't know how. It's a lot of work, regardless of how they did it. Two million to two and a half million people singing the same song at the same time time. It's mind-blowing with no technology. So we don't know how they did it, but the question is, why did they do it? We already talked about it. They did it because of what God did for them, but they did it because God's worthy of their praise. He is worth the effort. When they gathered together to sing this song together, what they're saying is, God, we love you, and you are worth the effort that it takes to figure out how to do this. You're worth it. But now, we got to think about us. What challenges do we have to singing together on a Sunday morning? What are the challenges? I could think of two big ones. One, getting here on time. That's one. And the other is simply choosing to sing. Right? Just saying, I'm going to sing, no matter how I feel. That's it. We'll come back to this in the next steps. I got a lot more to say about that. But look at verse 19. It breaks from the song, tells us again why they sang. Specifically, it says, For when the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. And then verse 20 and 21 gives us a, what happens also. It says, Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, and the sister of Moses, don't say that, but she is, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Sound familiar? Is verse 1 again. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. And so we're not sure whether this is a song that they, they kept singing again and again, and that's what's going on, or whether she taught the women the dancing and the singing and, and the tambourine part to go along with it. Either way, when we gather to worship, we have instruments, right? It's biblical. When we gather for worship, you might find yourself swaying a little bit and, and doing, I do something like this. I have no ability to dance, but it's biblical. You can move a little bit. Right? It's right here in the Bible. And it's other places as well. But enough about these Israelites and their singing. We gotta we gotta figure out what is our reason to sing. Because we were not slaves in Egypt, delivered uh, from a cruel Pharaoh who was about to kill us, and then we crossed the Red Sea when God confused them with a cloud, and then we got over, and then he crushed them all, and we're celebrating because they were about to kill us, and now we're alive, and they're dead, and we won, and now we're free. That's not our story. What is our story? We'll talk about that. But I want you to write this down. We have reason to sing because we, too, have been delivered. We too have been delivered. No, we weren't slaves in Egypt, but we were, the Bible tells us, slaves to sin. We were facing certain death. We were facing the wrath of God. We read that in 1 Thessalonians 5 earlier. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, left heaven. He came to earth. He lived the sinless life on our behalf. And he died on the cross the death that we deserve to die so that our sins could be forgiven. We could be set free from the bondage, the slavery to sin. And Jesus said in John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. He's given each of us the Holy Spirit so we can walk in that freedom. And so as we consider this, 
we have reason to sing, and I would argue we have a greater reason to sing than these Israelites. These Israelites were spared from an earthly, temporal situation. We have been spared, if we are in Christ, from an eternal dilemma, one that has effects that will never end. We'll be with Jesus in heaven forever and ever. But I do think it's important that I address another objection. I think it's fair. Um, Because maybe you're thinking, okay, I agree with all this, but you guys don't want me to sing. Have you heard me sing? I sound like a dying cat. You know what the Bible says? It says, make a joyful noise. Has anybody ever described something that sounds good as noise? You're like, what's that noise? Turn that down. All that stuff. You say, it's a beautiful sound. What's that noise? That's how we use the word noise in in, in our day, right? Make a joyful noise. Sing. And guess what? We might not like it, but God does. Let's be for real. I might not like your singing. You might go to Eric and say, hey, can I be on the worship team? They put you up there, and I'm like, they need to get off. (laughs) I might say that, like, for real. I'm not kidding. Um, I would do that, but he would filter you before that, so he would be the bad guy, not me. But anyways, that, that, that could happen. We have standards for people up here, but we're all called to worship. They're called not to be distracting, right? We all can hear their voice, right? You ever notice that? If you look across the room, you see people singing across the room, you're like, I have no idea what they sound like. You know why? Because we turn the volume up. <laughs> turn it up loud so we get the best of both worlds, right? God can hear you and we can't. That's the way I like it, right? So that's what we do, right? We got to have the volume loud enough so you can sing as joyfully as you want and it's not distracting to anybody because all we hear are the beautiful voices up here and God hears your beautiful voice that's not beautiful to us, right? We're good. So... Sing your heart out. But if you're here and you're like, CJ, you're saying I've been delivered and all this stuff and I don't, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Listen, I would love to sit down with you, have a phone call with you this week and share with you just my story of how God has delivered me from bondage to sin and how God has given me an assurance of forgiveness of sins and an eternity with him. I would love to share that with you uh, if, if you are confused or wondering what that's like. Uh, on, a, on a person that's living today's level. There's other people here that I'm sure that would be happy to do that with you as well. And so um, if you, in a minute, I'm going to have everybody scan the Connect card. You can check a box on there for beginning a life with Jesus. That'll let us know, hey, if somebody wants to have a conversation about these types of things. We would love to do that. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and have everybody get their phones out, if you would, and scan the QR code to take you to the Connect card. Um, On that Connect card, you can let us know your name. Uh, We need that and an email if you want us to contact you.